welcome to episode four, part two. Now, before I get into anything here, I'd like to point out that this was some of my earliest filming when I was still trying to figure out what to do with the camera. My miking wasn't very good, and things changed quite a bit before I started publishing things. But we got some really great content. So I'd like to apologize to my father, Bruce Slater, for not being able to present his content in the way that it probably should be. But I hope you enjoy it nonetheless. There's some excellent information in there, and it'll really help you understand what uh, the designers, Martin Oldfield, Nicholas Walter, and Bruce Slater are going through when they work on these projects. Uh, that brings up another point. We have three amazing designers, and uh, Nicholas Walter, I have not been able to catch up with him to do a, a segment on him and the work that he's done, the amazing work that he's done on the cockpit section. So all the tubes and plug-ins, and even the hardware, the ferrules, the joint plates, all of that. And I think this is probably well over a year ago, but he had 1,800 parts that he had designed in CAD for us for that section. Now, his work also extended beyond that into the integrating structure that we talked about in a previous episode. So he's done an amazing amount of work and using the parts that we had removed from uh, the cockpit section from Roger Marley, E3D reverse engineered those and that data went to Nicholas to verify geometry and make sure everything was right. And that's how we got to the level that we're at with our cockpit section now where we've got a fixture table and uh, we're starting to set up and cut material and things like that. So huge kudos to Nicholas. I really hope that we can catch up with him and do an episode just on the work that he did because it is phenomenal. So here we go with uh, part two and we're gonna get more into the CAD stuff. Uh, I hope you guys enjoy. Between the three of us, we're uh, reviewing uh, the some uh, 13,940 uh, drawings. Uh, from those, we are um, uh, reviewing for uh, actually production errors and minor uh, anomalies, uh, building 3D models to make sure that uh, everything is uh, fitting and to tolerance and uh, 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 cut producing flat patterns, form blocks uh, for the manufacturing process. The one thing about these Hawker aircraft uh, drawings is uh, they were done at wartime. Uh, I'm not sure how big the team of uh, drafters and designers was, but you can bet that they were under uh, huge pressure to get these uh, drawings to the shop floor and into manufacturing as, as soon as possible. Um, so drawing standards, the original drawing standards are, are certainly different than today, but um, there were mistakes made and, uh, and, and anomalies within the drawings that made the parts, uh, uh, at least on the drawing form, uh, unmanufacturable. So uh, I'm sure that the, the people in the shop were actually manufacturing parts, were um, uh, finding these making the corrections in their uh, to and, and their jigging and their tooling um, but perhaps that uh, revision and update didn't get back to the drawing uh, department um, and are not reflected in these drawings we're finding those by systematically going in great detail on every one of these parts and pieces the only way we can make corrections is to uh, build 3D models. Uh, from the 3D models, doing uh, DXF toolpath files and uh, reducing the amount of time uh, required to actually manufacture parts. Make it easier for the guys in the shop. The thing that the CAD does now is it, it can take all the available information and manipulate it and make it work within the model itself. So you're eliminating things like the plaster masters. The, uh, you, you may want to go to a master hinge tool or something like yeah. that. 
But basically, the or the CAD determines all that for you. It makes sure it works in space, time, yeah. in the actual model. It's so, really a, 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 a huge labor saver for uh, all the lofting and uh, uh, trigonometry and all the, the things that the guy in the shop would have to do uh, to make even the simplest part. What's the process that you use to start from maybe not all complete sets of drawings or from original documentation and how do you use that to verify and build components in CAD? These are uh, scanned drawings, as I said earlier, coming from uh, the microfilm, original Hawker manufacturing, that are of various degrees of quality. These drawings are reviewed uh, in extreme detail sometimes. Uh, uh, as, as the information piece parts are built on the computer in a 3D model, they're checked off as a form of uh, 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 paper to create a paper trail for what we've done, what uh, parts drawings uh, are, TIFF parts drawings, the old ones, are, uh, are available. Identifying drawings that are not particularly available, but maybe uh, we need to build uh, uh, or examine original uh, aircraft parts, which uh, apparently are very far and few between for the, for the Typhoon. These documents will be saved uh, uh, along with the plane um, as, a, as a paper trail for how um, uh, we, in 2020, interpreted these uh, 1939 drawings. With the individual parts built from their original drawings, the assemblies are put together where we're confirming uh, fit and uh, tolerances and uh, alignment, drill uh, hole placement, rivet, rivet placement uh, are all in agreement with, um, with the original manufacturer drawings. When parts are missing, we then uh, can use these virtual 3D models, uh, maybe in conjunction with photographs, or maybe in conjunction with uh, a, a partial drawing or a minor reference on, a, on another drawing, and, uh, and hopefully, uh, 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 if nothing more is available, uh, produce a, an, a reasonably accurate part that's going to allow for uh, airworthy certification. So your your technique for marking up drawings has also changed. You, with the forward monocoque and some of the other assemblies you've worked on, uh, you started off with a paper copy of the original drawing. The paper copies were all marked up and drawn and then indexed and, and filed with the, the assembly. And it's a method of us tracking exactly what changes have been made, what's missing, what we have, and having that on file for our, uh, the work that we do when we do our certification of components. Well, over time, over the time that I've been on this project, we have been, uh, uh, I should say, modernizing and uh, no longer working with just paper markups, uh, hard copy printed, uh, original drawings, but uh, now going fully uh, electronic with all the, all the markups and, uh, and uh, drafting notes that we're putting on these uh, pieces of paper. So what are some of the assemblies that you've been working on? Uh, forward monocoque uh, is, uh, is the big one that uh, I've recently finished on the CAD aspect of things. The, I think all the, the DXF files have been released to the shop. Um, a, a big part of it was uh, for the monocoque was uh, it required a rather large fixture and uh, uh, no drawings, original drawings were available for that. So we uh, actually had to build all the parts, build the assembly of the monocoque before the fixture could even be designed. So now the fixture is uh, is done. The monocoque is uh, well underway in construction. Uh, the other thing, and this is uh, Martin Ofield uh, primarily on this, is the after monocoque, which is uh, 
uh, well underway at least on uh, design uh, review. Um, the, in this case, the, the models have been roughed out uh, to build and develop a fixture around uh, uh, the aft monocar. Uh, Martin's still uh, buried up to his eyeballs in, in drawings and, uh, and data <laughs> on this, but uh, that's in the works as well. So you're doing the, the fixture design and Martin's doing the structure design for that fixture? For the rear monocoque, yes. So, you know, we're working uh, in, in tandem on that. Uh, uh, Martin doing the, the aircraft, I'm doing the fixture. And that's interesting too because it takes the two different assemblies and two different draftsmen working together and then putting their combined efforts into one and having to ensure that it all fits properly for the next stage of production. Yeah, yeah, I've got a confirmation of fit and tolerance. I thought the fin was a good place to start. It's, it's got complex compound surfaces, so I had to learn some more uh, surface manipulation. Okay. Um, but that's standing me in good stead now, getting, getting into the, uh, the, the rear monocoque. There's some, uh, a couple of nasty little profile changes <laughs> at the back end there. Um, I was able to handle that quite well. So I, I managed to produce flat patterns, form blocks, um, and the end went merrily along and just beat some metal over the form blocks and punched some lightning holes in them. And, you know, lo and behold, we got a bunch of fin ribs. Right? Yeah, a little bit more than that. <laughs> <laughs> Just about, yeah. I like to simplify things. Keep keep it simple, right? Yeah. <laughs> the work that you've done on the wing pins, that's, that's crucial. Like you said, it's on hold, but um, that's using almost solely reverse engineering surviving parts. Yeah, that's correct. Yeah, I, mean, uh, I don't know if we can show that on here, but if we, Ian makes photographs and dimensions them all up and we just make models of them and that produces of course a solid model from which you create the i call i guess we call them dxf files which create the programming to machine the parts right? yeah. yeah so so in that um again the, even though they're not complete we can we've got a a working model anyway that yeah. we can start plugging in as other parts become available yeah. There you go, guys. That is uh, now the completion of our design episode. Um, I do want to add, though, that during my filming uh, this summer with my father, I didn't get enough good footage uh, or footage that would work for this episode that described the radiator fairing. Now, a lot of you that have been following us for a while will know that the radiator fairing was actually designed by Matt Myers in the UK uh, quite a number of years ago. And he took it and designed from the drawings that we had all of the original frames, the main frames in the radiator fairing. And with that, he designed a beautiful rotisserie uh, fixture for us to complete the production of our radiator fairing with. So because of some of the lessons learned with the Ford monocoque and the way things are lofted on paper and how they don't necessarily line up with reality, um, we stopped production on the radiator fairing because I was manually lofting it. And we wanted to verify this entire package uh, in CAD before we went too far with a very complex assembly. Now, the work that Matt Myers did was fantastic. So Bruce has taken it and he's gone the next step further and he's been filling in all the voids between those mainframes with all the intercostals, little stiffeners and brackets and hinge points and the radiator flap, all sorts of stuff. So it's become quite a complex assembly and there's a lot of parts to it. With luck, we'll be able to pick this one up and start producing more components on it as the monocoque section comes to completion. So thank you very much for watching, guys. Please, if you can head over to our paid subscription channel and do that, it would be great. It helps support the project. And uh, if not, please head over to YouTube and subscribe to that because every little bit helps us. Anyway, take care, guys. Cheers.